Hi, good morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing this morning with our talk, um, talks on Acts. So we continue the series. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've heard from Dave on Acts 6 and uh, last week with Martin on Acts 7. And today, funnily enough, we're in Acts 8 and the title of the talk is uh, The Scattered Church Multiplies. It's interesting because at this point in the book, we come to uh, a section end and a section beginning. Um, the book neatly fits into many different categories, but one way of looking at it is over time and over people. And uh, in Acts 8, we start a new section. So uh, chapters 1 to 7 uh, talk about primarily Peter and the apostles, and they're based in Jerusalem. And over this time period, it covers a time of around two years. As we come into Acts 8 and Acts 8 to Acts 12, um, we now change focus from um, Peter and we start looking at a, a guy called uh, Philip, who we will meet in a little while. And we change focus from Jerusalem. Rather, now we're looking to Samaria, which is the area, the district around Jerusalem, some 30 to 40 miles in uh, away from there. And this this. Um, set of chapters from chapter 8 to 12 that is going to cover 14 years of time so when we read it sometimes we we misunderstand we we misappreciate just the times that have been that's been covered and uh, over these um, chapters we, we're going to be looking at 14 years and then the remainder of the book changes focus again. Uh, so uh, chapter 13 onwards starts to look at uh, Apostle Paul that we will often that many of us will know well. And this now the district is to the ends of the earth. It includes the other areas, too. And that again will cover another 14 years. So as we come to the text today, bear that in mind that verse uh, chapters 8 through to 12, we're talking about a 14 year period. So let's start reading our text, uh, Acts uh, 8, uh, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who'd been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all played, paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. And so there was great joy in the city. Well, who was Philip then? So, well, we heard his name mentioned both in Acts 6, as Dave was talking, and again last week, um, as uh, Martin was talking on Acts 7, uh, Philip was one of the deacons of um, uh, assigned by the apostles to do pastoral work primarily. These guys were obviously uh, excellent in what they did and they were also good at other things and as we see later uh, Philip was also a great evangelist and he also was filled with the Holy Spirit and performed miracles that Jesus did too. But let's just give it a little bit of thought because it says that the church was scattered. Well, what does that actually mean? A few words, but actually there's a great depth behind it. Philip was on the run. He was a refugee in his own country. He was fleeing for his life from the Jews who were persecuting him, from Saul and his followers. He must have grabbed what he had and maybe he travelled with others, but he fled for his life. He gave up everything that he knew, everything that was in Jerusalem that would have been the norm, the house, the job, the things that he did, his friends, his family. They could have been scattered separately. They could have been dispersed all over the place. This brings to my attention anyway, circumstances around the world. And as you know, I um, have the privilege of working uh, in Ukraine. Um, and there in 2014, this is very similar to what happened. 
the people in the east of Ukraine were um, overrun by uh, Russian separatists and the church was scattered. They fled for their lives. They left everything that was normal to them, their jobs, their family homes, the things that they were used to, the cities that they lived in. And they had to run and drive and flee for their lives. They were under great pressure, great persecution. What happened? Well, these people in Ukraine, my friends, some of them, they fled to different cities, different towns, places that they felt um, were secure and safe. But it wasn't home. But nonetheless, churches are now planted in all of those places. The people knew what it was that they had to do. They knew what was important. What would I be like in that situation? It's a question that I often ask myself as I speak to these guys regularly. I hope that I would respond the same way, but we don't know, do we, until we're under this pressure. What's important comes out when we're under pressure. The things that we talk about are the most important things in our lives. And for Philip, the most important thing was evidently Jesus. Because as he fled with the clothes that are on his back and maybe a few possessions, the trauma and the strain of everything that had happened over the last days, weeks, months, he still proclaimed Jesus. It was the top of his list. It is what everything that he wanted to do. Isn't it amazing that he preached the gospel and that the paralyzed and the lame were healed, that with shrieks, evil spirits were coming out of people. I think one of the most favorite phrases in this little section is that, and so there was great joy in that city. You see, I believe that where we preach Jesus, there's joy because I believe that where Jesus is, there is joy. He brings hope and hope brings joy. So even in the depth of great despair, when we have hope, we can also have joy. Our hope is in Jesus, not in ourselves. It's in one greater than us, the one who is in charge, even when we are out of control. We've used that phrase lots over the last 12 months, haven't we, with COVID? But similarly here, it was the same for Philip. Now, in, in verse 9, we get introduced to a new character, a character called Simon. So let's have a look. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. This is quite a shocking um, set of words, isn't it, for us in the UK in 2021. Sorcery and these sorts of things aren't sort of prevalent in our lives. We don't see them. They're not obvious in our culture. But around the world, it is quite remarkably different. If you travel to Asia or to Africa, you will understand more about witch doctors and sangomas and the likes. This was a way that um, people made money. You see the effects it has on people in Africa, where again, I've had the privilege to live and also to travel. We, you see the way that the villages and people respond to these people. Great respect, often led by fear. And interestingly, one of the key points here is about Simon and where he points to the powers by which he was doing this stuff. In verse 9, it says that he boasted that he was someone great. 
And this is a great way of measuring where the power is coming from, because you will also notice that when Philip was talking, he was talking about um, Jesus Christ and that the power was from Jesus. It was all about Jesus. It wasn't about him. Whereas for Simon, it's the other way around. Simon, it's all about him. He was someone great. People exclaimed how great he was. This points at a wrong spirit, the wrong way round. Now, interestingly, some of this reminds me of 1 Kings 18 in the Old Testament. Do you remember the story where the prophets of Baal are in competition with Elijah, the prophet of Yahweh? They have a bit of a, a prophet off and they are going to compare and see whose God is the true God. Do you remember they decide they're going to build an altar and on the altar they're going to put a cow and without setting fire to it they're going to call on their gods to see which one is the true God, which one is going to burn it up. The 450 prophets of Baal, they build their altar and they put their cow on top of it and then they circle it and they chant and they shout and they scream and they beg and they pray and nothing happens. After a considerable amount of time, Elijah obviously gets bored of this and starts poking a little bit of fun at them. And in the end, he says, come on, guys, it's my turn. He builds an altar. He puts a cow on the top. He doesn't just do that, but he puts rocks around it. He doesn't just do that. He, he digs a big pit around it and he pours buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of water on it. So he's confident. He knows that when he calls, his God will be able to do it. And so he calls on Yahweh the true God. And what happens is that Yahweh comes and he um, sets it on fire, but he doesn't just set it on fire. The cow just doesn't disappear. The wood doesn't just disappear, but the rocks too. The water also, it burns a hole in the ground. In this text, in Acts 8, it's the same. God is not going to be outdone by the works of Simon the sorcerer. To the point where Simon the sorcerer is amazed by the works of Jesus through Philip and is ultimately saved. So we come to verse 14. And now we turn our attention back to the apostles. You see, uh, the apostles in Jerusalem had heard of everything that was happening in Samaria and, it, and that they had accepted the word of God. And they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. This is a huge shift in the church history. Up until to date, the Jews were the ones being saved. Those maybe that had been converted to Judaism had also been saved in Jerusalem. But as the church had scattered across the lands, it had come across all sorts of different people. Generally, Samaritans and Gentiles, it's the same thing, they're non-Jews. This was a new thing, new thing happening. And when the news had come to them in Jerusalem that Jesus was saving non-Jews, they needed to go and see. And so they went, they, they went to have a look and they got involved with what was happening. It was an exciting time and they weren't sure what was happening. And so what did they do? Well, they laid their hands on them and they prayed that the Holy Spirit would come. It was a test. Were they truly saved? Was the Holy Spirit going to land on non-Jews? And, and it did. And it was wonderful. And it's wonderful news for the whole of church history, because that means that you and I, if we're not Jews, can be saved. God, Jesus is interested in us. It's not just the chosen race of Jews. Wonderful times. And that was judged by that the Holy Spirit was in them, that they accepted the Holy Spirit. And as we know, many of us who have been baptised in the Holy Spirit, that means that they would have had spiritual gifts, almost certainly, maybe speaking in tongues for the first time. It was an exciting time and a time where Christian church history changed. Not only were Jews to be accepted, it was also non-Jews, you and I potentially. Verse 18, it continues. 
When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he, off he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Now Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and are captive to sin. And then Simon answered, pray to the Lord so that none of what you may say may happen. When I read this text, I'm just like, oh man, well, Simon, what have you done? You've made such a flaw, such an error. And then also when I think of Peter, I'm like, man, ouch, you're still quite pointy, aren't you? Straight to the point, defending the gospel, but straight to the point. There's all sorts of debate here about whether Simon was actually saved or not. Now, for me, I just think that this is an illustration of things that happen in many of our lives, that at points in our time, we revert back to old trends, to old things that we know that we shouldn't do. Simon had been used to offering power for money. It was a way of making money for him. And at this point, it's almost as if that's exactly where he reverted back to. And it's such a shame. But Peter puts him right. And he exclaims and he defends the gospel. It's not about money. This is about God. It's a free gift. A free gift from God for God to point towards God. I love Simon's response. It's exemplary. Please pray for me that none of this will happen. He wants to repent. I follow this guy on Instagram an American guy who's really into his fitness and eating well and all this stuff. He's got quite a following. It's interesting because he talks about the path and the path for him is fitness, exercise and eating well. And he has a phrase and it says, it doesn't matter how many times you fall off the path, it's more important how quickly you get back on it. And that's true, isn't it? It's true for us too. Not about fitness and health. It's about Jesus and following him and getting it right. Sometimes we will fall off the path. It happens from time to time. It may happen quite a lot, but it doesn't, it's more important, not about falling off, but how quickly you get back on. Because if you get stuck in a rut, in those wrong thoughts, in that wrong thing, doing the right, the wrong thing for the wrong reason, we can get off the path and we can stay off the path for too long. The challenge here is to be like Simon, isn't it? To get, jump back, straight back on. Man, I made a mistake. God, will you forgive me? Will you put me back right? I want to respond like Simon when I get it wrong. That's the aim. Open-hearted, warmly. And as we begin to land now, we're going to come to the last um, verse and then we're going to look to apply this. So in verse 25, it says this, uh, it's talking uh, about the apostles. Uh, after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. And so the journey continues, doesn't it? It continues for Peter and for John. It continues for Philip and all those scattered. The change, the scenery, everything changes. Th things move on. We go different places. But the message stays the same. We continue pr to preach Jesus. We continue on the vision and the mission that he's given us. And so as we conclude, a couple of points. We are a part of a worldwide church. We are privileged to live where we live, where we don't have very many pressures. There isn't really persecution in the truest sense of the word. But many of our brothers and sisters around the world, they absolutely do live under the pressure, the constant pressure, the 24 by 7 pressure of persecution. Today, will you pray for them? Today, will you consider them in your prayers? Would you lift them before God? Would you ask God to sustain them? And then when we look at ourselves, 
What would we be like if this happened to us? If all of a sudden something drastic happened and things changed significantly, how would we act? How would we react? Why don't you consider that? What's that going to look like for you? If we were scattered, would we preach Jesus? Is he the most important thing in our life? Is the mission of Jesus the most important thing? Are we excited about him and about what he's doing? I want us to consider that and I want us to pray for one another and pray for ourselves that we will become more excited about Jesus, that when pressure comes on, the excitement comes out. And this is true whether we stay in the same place or whether we move around. The journey changes, the times change. Our roles, our stage, our role in work, it all can change. But the mission never changes. The mission continues to be to proclaim Jesus. So as we conclude, I'm going to pray and then we'll finish there. Father, I want to thank you for the book of Acts, warts and all. Lord, I want to thank you that it isn't all sugar-coated, but that when we dig, we understand the implications that it had on people's lives, on the, uh, the implications that it has across uh, the world and for our friends. Lord, I want to pray that you would be with us as we contemplate this and that we look to apply it in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you for listening. We finished and we'll complete there.